Welcome to the Menopause and Cancer podcast, where we speak with cancer survivors, patients, and incredible experts in their fields to help us find solutions to our symptoms and ideas to improve our health. My name is Danny Bennington, and today we're going to have a therapy session. We'll talk about loss, finding new identity, and how to best make sense to be in this postmenopausal body, whatever age you are. I'm not sure what I was expecting when I invited psychotherapist Stella Duffy onto this podcast episode. I thought it might become another doing episode where you're sitting there with pen and paper out like I know so many of you do when you listen to our episodes. But this one is different. This conversation touched something very deep inside of me and it was as if I was talking to Stella, the therapist, myself today. There is something unique about being able to let go of having to fix everything. And I'm such a fixer. I want to help all of you have a more empowered, more educated and more informed menopause experience and also cancer experience. But sometimes it's important to cut through the crap and also address the bullshit that comes with constantly having to feel positive for everyone else as a cancer survivor. We talk so clearly about how much Stella expected of herself and how much we expect of ourselves when we navigate post-cancer and menopause. And we also talk about our biggest problem and the biggest fear for so many of us, and that is mortality. And so there are many things in today's conversations which can really hit home, and they did for me. And so I did need to give myself a really big hug at the end of this conversation. And it was just beautiful to be here with Stella. So walk slowly into the mystery of this conversation. Forget your pen and paper and notepad today. You won't need it. This is a conversation between me and Stella, but really between you and you. You, the most important person there is to show up for in this experience of our life. Stella, as a psychotherapist mm -hmm. and breast cancer survivor yourself, how do we make sense when cancer and menopause gets thrown at us, regardless of the age, with life and what happens to us and our mortality, fertility. Let's talk a little bit about all of that away from troubleshooting and finding sure. solutions to our symptoms. Sure. Um, so for me personally, I had my first breast cancer at 36, my second at 50. Um, I've had all the treatments except the hormonal ones. So I've had loads of surgeries. I've had chemotherapy. I've had radiotherapy. Um, my cancers weren't hormonal, so tamoxifen wasn't relevant for me. Um, but at 36, my wife and I were just trying to have children. Just literally the day of my first biopsy was the day we were going to do the first insemination with our baby father. Wow. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was really brutal. And this was in 2000. There were there was nothing like this. There was none of this kind of support. I wasn't offered any psychotherapeutic support. I did luckily find a cancer therapist myself. Um, but there was, there was none of the story out there that we have now that is around how difficult it can be to confront both of those things. So while a lot of the stories around breast cancer when I was 36 and 2000 were how hard it must be to lose your hair or to, you know, to have surgery. I was losing my fertility. I was menopausal because of chemotherapy at 36. And, you know, the world, the world and its attitudes to cancer would like us just to be grateful that we're alive. And I have a very dear friend who's had a brain tumor for over 10 years now and has had lots of surgeries and, and lived, but really difficult living. Um, and he just says, you know, we're not the lucky ones, uh, us who've had cancer and survived. The lucky ones are people who've never had a cancer. Hmm. And so it's not that I don't recognize with gratitude my life. Of course I do. But to be a young, fertile, you know, we knew we were fertile because we'd done the tests because we were gay and we had to think about it differently. Um, and then woman and lose all of that overnight, literally, um, was really difficult and there was very little support. And while, yes, my hot flushes were really cumbersome and um, right at the beginning there were 40 an hour, <laughs> I remember counting them one hour, 
Um, and I got some support with that, some medical support. Our menopause story, when it only concentrates on the vasomotor symptoms, when it only concentrates on hot flushes, night sweats, um, brain fog, how complex they are, and yes, they are difficult, fails to address how incredibly difficult it is to be young and menopausal, to lose your fertility when you are young. And yes, it comes back for some people, it didn't for me. To be thrown into an embodied experience of being older, or indeed old, I would really like it if people would start addressing menopause as the beginning of old instead of calling it midlife. You are kidding yourself if you're 51, which is the average age for British menopause, and you think you're midlife. What, you're going to be 102? Um, <laughs> it's not midlife. It's the, it might be the middle of your adult life, let's say 20 to 80, but it's definitely not midlife. So let's talk about it, honestly, as the beginning of old, because if we do that, we then realize how incredibly hard it is for us when we're younger to be ostensibly at the beginning of middle age or at the end of being young and suddenly physically and emotionally thrown into being older while confronting our mortality at the same time. It's enormous. It's enormous. And I think why your story will resonate with so many of our listeners is because you are going through this as both embodied experiences as mm. a young woman at 36, mm. but also now in your 60s. Yep. And we have listeners who are in their 60s, 70s and 80s who come and listen to the podcast because they need to troubleshoot their symptoms. And then we have people in their 20s who think, how the heck did this happen? I feel like I'm in a body of an 80 year old or what they think that body should feel like, and yet they haven't even hit that 30 year mark. Hey, thanks for watching this episode. 73% of people who watch my podcast haven't yet clicked the subscribe button, and 11% haven't hit the button to turn on notifications. I want these conversations to reach as many women as possible who might need to hear them. So if you've ever enjoyed listening to this podcast, please hit subscribe now. Stella, can I ask you what happened with you and your wife and the dream of becoming yeah. mothers? Um, what was the plan and how? what happened? Well, the plan was that we um, we knew that we wanted a father. So we had asked a really good friend and, and he was very happy to be our baby father. His wife was very happy to be our fairy godmother. They hadn't wanted children themselves. Um, we'd done all the preparation that, that it's slightly easier now, but this was back in... 1999, 2000, it was more complex. Um, you know, we weren't allowed to get married at the time. We weren't allowed to be civilly partnered at the time. When I went into surgery for my first breast cancer, my wife, my now wife, we'd been together at the time 10 years, we've been together 33 years, wasn't allowed to be my next of kin. I had to put my brother's name on the form. Um, I think sometimes we forget how fast things have changed for us as gay people. It's great, but it's within my living memory that this was yeah. impossible. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I had uh, embryos made before chemotherapy, and that was hopeful. Although the you know you get your diagnosis, and then an, an egg retrieval within two weeks, and then surgery, and then chemotherapy. Many of your listeners will have been through this process, and how incredibly hard that is because it's put so much hope in those embryos. And this was 23 years ago, and the embryos did survive thawing, and I had five rounds of IVF, but none of them survived in me. Wow. And I think, again, I'm sure some of your listeners will have experienced this. My body, my own body became a site of death, that I became the graveyard for those embryos that were our babies. Um, we gave them names. It still hurts. Of not, course it does. Yeah, not in, a, not in a way that I don't think my life is deeply valuable. I really do. And not in a way that doesn't mean that I don't understand that I have made other gains. I've had to work for them, but I have made them out of my infertility. But it still hurts that we didn't get the dream. And then later on, um, as my treatment progressed, my wife did get pregnant, but miscarried and never got pregnant again. Yeah. So we had to eventually stop trying and 
any of your listeners who've had to stop trying will understand that that is a really difficult choice. And as a gay couple, we don't get a happy accident. And our culture would like us to believe that anything is possible if we just try oh. hard enough. You know, it's like that awful, well, you were having negative thoughts. Of course your cancer came back. Or, you know, well, if you just try to believe harder, fight harder. There comes a time in all of our lives when we have to stop brutalizing ourselves, accept what is, and find the value in what is. And personally, I was often very guilty of worried about my negative thoughts. I thought, you're going to make your cancer come back by thinking all these negative things. And I was putting so much pressure on myself to be the positive person I yeah. longed to be. Until yeah. one morning, I luckily woke up and thought, you don't have to run mm. a marathon <laughs> just because you've survived breast cancer. Uh -huh. You don't have to raise thousands of pounds for charity. You don't have to eat a certain way. And a little weight had lifted off my shoulder, but something in the back of my head sometimes still nags today. Not doing enough, not working hard enough, not trying hard enough, not successful enough. And I know that is my self-criticism and I know I have a huge part in myself and I had to learn to bring my self-compassion back into my day. And I've got post-it notes. If you look around my office, I have post-it notes of self-compassion to remind myself because my self-criticism is so big. But Stella, I can't help but think that cancer comes with so much loss the loss of the life we had, suddenly everything changes, the loss of a dream, the loss of possibilities, the loss of income, the loss of earning, like the list is long, 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 long. When you decided to stop trying, how did you come to that decision? Um, well, IVF's tough, right? And it even now, it doesn't have great success rates, though those companies who want to make a lot of money out of us will tell us it does. Um, we realized that we didn't want to do this to our bodies anymore. Yeah. That, that my body with cancer as well as IVF and my wife's body after, the, after she'd miscarried and had, then went on to try IVF, we had put our bodies through enough. And that if this was the life we were to lead ourselves as a couple, because a couple can be a family too, right? Mm. She, my wife was a carer for her mother for nine years. You can't tell me that's not being a family. You know, I'm the youngest of seven kids. I have 15 nieces and nephews wow. and we've got 31, 32 great nieces and nephews. It is not the same as having one's own child. I am not saying that. However, I do think that there is a place where I began to address my internalized pronatalism that really helped me you know pro the pronatal attitude that it is better to be a parent in our lives than not is very prevalent and that's prevalent at the same time as we're telling mothers they're wrong for every single thing they do all the time so you cannot win if you're a mother you can never get it right if you're not a mother you're not really a graduate woman and I had imbibed some of that just as in a heterosexual, heteronormative, you know, homophobic culture, I had imbibed some internalized homophobia. And I really had to work on myself to trust that I'm a good enough person without being a mother. It's so profound what you say, because in truth, I have thought sometimes when I spoke to people about my experiences, I thought, well, you don't really understand. And I am a girl's girl. I love women so much. I have so much adoration. And to be really truthful, what you've just said is so powerful that there is this concept in society that you are only a graduate woman when mm -hmm. you've done it all. And it what all. does it mean, yeah. it all? And that's it's crazy. And, I mean, the absurdity that that all has to also include having children of of both genders and buying into a gender binary when we're so yeah. much more aware that a gender binary doesn't really exist anymore anyway. Just yeah. to pop back to your question about positivism, there is no research that says it is better to be positive during cancer. There is no proof of this. And what there is 
research about is how brutalizing we can be to ourselves by this I have to do it all attitude. I have to have it all. And you know what? As a second wave feminist from the 1970s and 80s, I apologize on behalf of second wave feminism to your generation that anybody ever said you can have it all because none of us can. I am so much more excited by fourth wave feminism that is acknowledging that white feminism isn't for everyone, that that black women exist within feminism, that queer women exist within feminism, that trans women exist within feminism, that our feminism can be broader and more inclusive. And the truth is that as long as we have a deeply patriarchal culture, we cannot have it all. And we damage ourselves when we insist we can. When we we insist that I have to have cancer, survive it brilliantly, become a, I don't know, dragon boat racing queen, look (laughs) amazing, uh, happily have photos taken of me, of my mastectomy scars. We do not ask men to get their testicular cancer scars out to prove that they're coping. And I'm all for the women who want to show their scars, but time after time, I have been asked, would you like to do a photo shoot and show your scars? As if that is the only way I can live with my cancer. We hardly ever ask this of men, and yet we ask it of women all the time. We have to run marathons. You're quite right. We have to raise hundreds of thousands of pounds. We have to be spokespeople for everyone's cancer, not just our own, when the only one we could even begin to understand is our own. And we also have to ideally be brilliant mothers and fantastic daughters and have a great career. This culture will not let that happen because it is too hard and too exhausting. And then we have to be positive with it all, all the time. And you know what? I never thought of that. Yes, we do show our scars and there is this Mm -hmm. empowerment piece that comes with it. And I never thought, you're absolutely right. No one asks us of the male counterpart. You don't. I have, yeah. I have a friend who um, had testicular cancer three years ago and he went, this is interesting. Because we talked about how often I've been asked, would you like to do a naked photo shoot? And And I've always had it done, actually, partly because I used to be a novelist and that was a bit weird. And certainly now I'm a psychotherapist. It's also weird. And of course, there are psychotherapists and novelists out there who do it and good on them. I'm for me right now, I might change my mind in 10 years, but right now I feel more private about that. But my mate with with one ball left was like, oh, why has no one asked me about doing a photo shoot? And I can't think of, I mean, maybe they exist, but compared to how many photo shoots I've seen of women who's, you know, their mastectomy scars or their reconstruction scars or the lovely tattoo they've had along their Dieppe reconstruction line, I do not see the same amount of naked photos of men. No, because and I'd even, love for any listener yeah, uh-huh. to send those photos in, tag us, <laughs> send them in. I think this is a calendar coming up. You know, there are lots of pink calendars for Christmas. This well, is exactly. it. One, we need one board <laughs> <laughs> men. Yeah, and, I mean, and, and, you're you know, so that, right. It might be fantastically empowering for them, but but why is yeah. it seen as the most empowering thing for women that we have to again be naked? We're vulnerable enough in our illnesses, in what comes after our illnesses, in living, as you say, with a a body that we feel like we're 80. Actually, I picked a number. At 36, I felt like I had suddenly become 55. I really, really did. And the the, I now live with advanced arthritis in most of my major joints and that's a bit being menopausal for a very long time it's definitely chemotherapy 23 years ago and having six rounds of pretty strong chemos they're much more targeted now and and I was going to say more gentle they're not more gentle when you're living it but we are better at chemotherapy now than we used to be Um, and it's hard enough to be in this body that is changing in and on me let alone to be asked now go be a role, be a role model. Now go fix it for everyone else. Let me ask the psychotherapist mm-hmm. and professional in you, how do we cope when a cancer diagnosis comes along? 
menopause is like the insult to our injury and we feel this huge loss and often the inability to really talk about all of that because we don't want to be a bother we don't want to share our deepest fears with everyone but we feel that we've lost so much of ourselves what would the psychotherapist say i love that you are here it means so much to me and my whole team behind this show we released this show for free to help people like you learn more about this often misunderstood topic and because so many of us feel totally under supported going through all of this in return, all I ask is that you help me on my mission by hitting the subscribe button and clicking the button to turn on notifications. It really helps a lot. Thank you. And now on with the show. I think the only way we do it is to acknowledge that it's grief. And, you know, grief is going on a bear hunt. You can't go around it. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You have to go through it. It is a grief to confront our own mortality. The culture we live in would like us to pretend that death doesn't happen. Yeah. And our cancer diagnoses remind us that this body, this body will age, it will get ill, it will die. I mean, it's basic Buddhism, really, right? It's, it's the, the noble sufferings of birth, sickness, old age, and death. And when we leap into menopause, particularly as younger women, we strongly experience sickness, the old aging of our body prematurely. And we are living with understanding that cancer is equated in our culture to death. And although we are very good now at treating cancer, it often comes back. It can kill us. To not pretend that's not true is really useful. To allow that it is a loss. To allow that it hurts. It's sad. And Again, there's this, it's the positive thinking lie, this pressure on us to be positive for those we love, for our partners, for our, you know, telling my mother I had cancer was so hard. So hard. Right. I hated she, telling it my was mom. so horrible. I, I haven't had to do it. I can imagine telling your children you have cancer is so hard. But, and sharing that honestly with people, I mean, there is research around this one, when we can share honestly that it is a loss, that we are not always going to be doing brilliantly, that today it really does feel like grief and what I really need to do is go to bed or hide or just sit and have a cup of tea and not have to think about it. Those things help us get through it. Even if it does end, because I don't want to pretend that there isn't mortality here. Even when our cancers do end in death, there is a getting through. It is a getting through to a new type of life or it is a getting through to the death that comes. I think quite often we don't talk about death enough when we talk about cancer. And I don't know about you, but some of my dearest friends have been the people I met through cancer things and I have lost them. Mm. They died of their cancers. They didn't lose a battle. They weren't fighting mm. to the end and then lost it. They did their damnedest and the disease was stronger than their physical body. And I don't want to pretend that those people didn't exist by not talking about death and cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, when we only look at our survival, when we only look at that, I think we're doing a bit of a disservice to the dear friendships we create and that won't always last physically, but they last emotionally. Mm -hmm. I think of uh, Annie Middleton, who was this amazing young, couple of years younger than me, a woman who, when I had my first cancer, created a, a photo exhibition. And some of us were naked, some of us weren't. And it was called Modern Amazons. And this mm -hmm. was in 1999, 2000, 2001. And it really was unusual then. It really was unusual to see, to share images of young women with cancer. She died of a um, recurrence and her children, and they must be adults now. I want to remember those people. You know, I don't mm. want to not talk about cancer and death and therefore I have to forget the people who made a difference for me. Yeah. So I think we, we live with it psychotherapeutically, certainly. We live with it by knowing that life contains loss. It can't not. That our mortality is actually the proof of life. You know, that because life ends, 
life exists. Mm. Mm. If life that didn't is... end, it wouldn't matter. It matters because it ends. Because it ends. When we lose our future as we thought it would be, when we lose hopes and dreams, um, the certainty, I think before I was diagnosed with cancer, I felt more certain that my life wouldn't end. <laughs> I know it's crazy yeah. to think that, but it almost felt nothing's really going to happen to yeah. me. My mortality, I wasn't touched by it as such. Did you have the feeling that you had to create a new version of yourself when you had to let go of that dream of becoming a maternal mother? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you then think, how am I going to create this Stella, this this post-cancer young woman who's now in menopause, who's not going to become a mother, or did it just happen? Um, a bit of both. Uh, I have a phrase which I've, I've used personally, but I also have used with, with clients with cancer, which is that we lose our mortality virginity. I like that. And you can't get it back. <laughs> you know, mm. for most of us, and this is, this is our culture, it's our world, we live as if we're going to live forever. Maybe until, you know, we, we get old or, or something awful happens, like having a cancer, because it doesn't get stabbed into us. It doesn't knock us down. It is my own body. You know, that's why I, the fighting analogies, I know they work for some people. They never worked for me. I didn't want to fight my cancer cells. They were me. I didn't want to fight my body. I wanted to embrace and love my body better instead of fighting my body better. Um, so for me, I, I say that, but actually I did. I fought really hard. Not the disease, but how do I survive this? I've got to survive this well. I worked through both cancers. I'm a freelancer. I have been freelance my entire life since I was 17. Freelance as a theatre maker and theatre director and actor and performer. Freelance as a novelist and short story writer. Freelance as a psychotherapist. I love the people who are attending to cancer and menopause in the workplace. I wish they would attend to cancer and menopause for freelance self-employed people because it is profoundly different. I have never once had sick pay. Not once. I have never had compassionate leave. I have never had holiday pay. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. the freelance professions are growing because of the appalling gig economy and this government and all sorts of things. But many more of us are having to be freelance. So what I did was I worked. I worked my butt off like an idiot. I mean, I needed the money, yes. But I, you know, I threw myself into my work because at least I had an identity there. I was Stella Duffy the performer. I was Stella Duffy the novelist. I was Stella Duffy the person who co-founded a UK-wide organization that works with communities. You know, Fun Palaces was an organization I founded just before, well, a year before I was diagnosed with my second cancer, and I threw myself into this, partly because I do love my work. I've always loved my work. I'm very fortunate. I'm the youngest of seven kids. My parents both had to leave school at 14. My siblings all had to leave school at 15, 16. I'm the one who got to stay on long enough to go to university. It's not because I'm so brilliant. It's because I got some opportunities they all didn't. But those opportunities meant that I had some more choices. And my choices were to go into the arts and, and work in communities and work in equalities. And I've always profoundly loved my work. But and <laughs> throwing myself into my work to the extent that I did with both cancers was brutalizing to me. Yeah. The disease. And I wonder if, I'm yeah. sorry, I just wonder if our listeners at home are reflecting as they're listening, because I know a lot of them are out on their dog walks or they're doing the dishes as they're doing the washing up and they're listening. And I wonder if they have thrown themselves into something, maybe not knowingly, um, maybe, maybe something's just happened. So many people take to social media and have big platforms and raise awareness and people do all sorts of things. Like I knew when I lost my identity, I I um, I threw myself into nesting and we'd moved house and I had three young children, so they were a great excuse. But as soon as they started school, another identity crisis hit me. I didn't 
want to be the mum that didn't work. I'd always worked, but there I was after cancer. I'd still had my wig on. And my mother-in-law said to me as we were doing something at home, she said, you could volunteer, Danny. And so I started to volunteer for an, um, a company that helps old people. And I found a little bit of identity in that because for a long, long time, I felt I needed to move out of the cancer scene I became a yoga teacher. I didn't want people with cancer in my yoga classes. I found another identity <laughs> as a yoga teacher. And you sort of angle your way through, sometimes knowingly and sometimes not knowingly. And it would be so interesting to hear from people what they have found, whether they created a new identity out and of their... I, I, I don't hmm. think that's unhelpful. It really is. But I think in retrospect, so say two or three years after my cancers after I'd thrown myself into whatever the new thing I, they weren't new all the time, actually. They were often sort of developments of my work. I realized I was exhausted. Yeah. I realized I had been wearing myself out. And I actually think there's, there's a bit of a problem with how we support cancer. So I've done work in the NHS, working as cancer support. And we tend to offer people that support with diagnosis now. I mean, none of that existed when I was having my first cancer, but it did a bit more with my second and certainly does now. And if we offer people support with their diagnosis, it can be really useful because of course you need someone ideally outside of the immediate family because they're so terrified for you. They don't necessarily want to hear your deepest, darkest fears or they do, but you don't want to say it. You know, it's complex. So it can be really useful to have that support from the stranger who is the therapist who has offered. But I think the time that most of us really need support is, I don't know, a year, two years, three years later, when we're almost looking back at what, what we've done to get through and we go, and we finally get a moment to take a breath. We appear to have survived and it's like, okay, what was that like? Because that's what trauma actually is. Trauma Technically, it's not the event that happens, it's how we react to the event. And it's what then gets embedded in us in terms of our reaction. So for me, both cancers, I reacted by going, right, well, I really have to live everything now. I'm going to really, really live. And if, yeah, that's great. It, it's a lovely reaction. But at the same time, if really, really living means only sleeping five hours a night while also beating myself up for not sleeping enough and won't that give me cancer again? Is it my fault again? You know, those, those combinations don't work. And one of the reasons I trained in existential psychotherapy is we're really interested in death and illness and the fact that actually no one has any genuine certainty ever. It's just that we're always trying to believe that we've got some certainty here and some certainty there that we can say to our partner you know see you tomorrow when they're going off for a, a work event none of us know that we don't know that really and our cancer diagnoses and i think simply the effect of menopause without a cancer diagnosis on many people might be the first time our body feels like it's not aligned with our spirit or our mind. And because we divide body and brain all too often, and you and I as, as yoga practitioners and teachers know this, um, you know, Sanskrit can put the words, can put body and mind together in the term yoga. English has to say body mind or mind body. <laughs> ah. <laughs> you know, it's, they're not separate. My brain is not separate from my mind, is not separate from my body, is not separate from my spirit. It, it's all mixed up as me. But, uh, a, a, you know, someone in perimenopause who's never had to experience their body uh, misbehaving, being uncontrollable, not doing what they want, it is shocking. It does make us feel groundless. You add a cancer diagnosis to that and cancer treatment to that, we lose our ground. Mm, and I also think I always lost the belief that my body can do the right thing. I really blamed my body for such a long time for giving and making and growing this cancer. And I'm not sure whether I'll ever regain that full trust in my body. Is this something that 
when you see people and psychotherapy or therapy can help? Because I think so many people lose the trust, the faith in their body. How yeah. can therapy help? Um, there are lots of embodied psychotherapy practices. Um, I very much encourage clients that I work with to come back to the body, like literally in the room, you know, they arrive to therapy or we're online, they open up their desktop and I'm like, let's just sit here for a minute. Let's just be here. And actually this is more problematic, I think, when people are having therapy online because it's very easy to go from having therapy to answering an email to going into another Zoom call, you know, one thing after the other. Whereas in old-fashioned, you know, going to a therapist's office or space, you would at least have to walk to the train or walk to the yeah. bus. I very much encourage people to remember that we are in the body. We don't get to be in the world without having a body. Everything we do is embodied. I think of a very dear friend of mine um, who's had MS for a very, very long time. And um, he, he's pretty much a talking head is the truth. He communicates with voice activated software. He can speak, but it's becoming more difficult. And this guy was a, an amazing comedy improviser and any of the improvisers that people might know from Who's Line or, you know, people like Paul Merton and, and, and those guys would tell you that Jim Sweeney, our mate, is the improviser's improviser. Jim is it. And people still talk to Jim, but it's a bit more like now that he's the oracle at Delphi because what he is is speaking from his head because his body doesn't work. Now, Jim has done a show about this back when he was more able and but he's still embodied just because he can't get up and walk and move around. He is still in and of his body. And to connect with people, if he's sending an email, he uses voice activated software. As a writer, I write from and of my body, whether I'm typing or working by hand or using voice activated software, it still comes from the body. What happens with the menopause symptoms, you know, the, the, problematic ones that everyone complains about because they forget about the good symptoms. For many people, the end of periods is a relief. For people for whom periods are deeply painful, who get endometriosis, who have other complications, it is a big relief. And the negative story about menopause really makes people scared to say, actually, for me, it was a relief. For many people, it can be. And I think we are, let alone the global majority who just see it as a relief from pregnancy, from unwanted pregnancies. Mm. Anyway, back to the embodied experience. Um, it is really important to remember that I do not exist outside of my body, that however ill I am, however able or disabled I am, and my um, extended arthritis has, has made you know walking very difficult for me for years. I've just had a hip replacement. I'm hopefully having a knee replacement soon. My joints are not very successful at being joints anymore. I live in this body that lives with chronic pain. I am of this body. And so when I work therapeutically with people, I really encourage people to come back to the body. And if we've had a cancer diagnosis, and sometimes with menopause, we can feel betrayed by the body, like it's let us down. A hundred percent. And what that does is it separates our mind spirit from the body itself, which is problematic. And the work then is to come back to the body. So to speak very candidly, a lot of women and me too find orgasms difficult after a diagnosis like that or after menopause because we're not trusting the body. It's not just that the symptoms or the drugs have got in the way. It's that how hard is it to let go and be in the oh, moment gosh, yeah. so when hard. you can't trust it, right? To come back to trusting the body, for me, it was a process of getting more involved in my yoga practice. I have a Buddhist practice that is chanting, so it's out loud, so it uses the breath. I started running, which I can't do now, but I did enjoy it. I, I only ever did couch to 5K, right? My wife runs marathons. I did couch to 5K time after time after time. Um, walking, touching trees. I love swimming. Um, I don't swim in cold pools between November and March, but I 
do get in the sea in December, just so it knows I still love it. Um, coming back to anything that reminds me of my body, including sex and sexuality, is really helpful. And I think this is another thing that gets in the way around cancer and menopause. There is a story that we lose our sexual identity after menopause. And there's certainly a story that we lose it after cancer. You put those two things together, it's tough. Um, what has been so lovely for me in my doctoral research, which is about the embodied experience of postmenopause, is speaking to women in their early 60s who are well postmenopause, as in all the symptomology has stopped as well. And hearing them talk about their revived sexual interest, how they got a new burst of sexual energy when they could let themselves come back to the body. And this division between body and mind is part of the problem for any feeling of, of losing ourselves as sexual beings. And it just makes so much sense because when you're firefighting and when mm. you're in this constant mm. fight yeah. or flight and your body thinks it needs to do everything to survive. Sure. And for me, that time went on for years and years and years where I crawled into bed every night feeling unsafe in my body, worried how the night is going to be, where I woke up touching myself from head to toe or not even daring to touch myself out of the worry what I might find. And every ache and pain was the worst case scenario. How can you, there was no trust in my body. <laughs> of course, I wasn't going to be letting go and thinking I can embark on recreating my sexuality mm -hmm. or finding my new self. It's, it makes sense. But the expectation was there. The expectation that I should, I should be doing this. I should be having sex x y and z it, the expectation was there because the feeling was you're a lesser off you're not doing as well you're not the patient that thrives if you've got it all this is where we started is having yeah. it all isn't it is but being it all it's the difference between cure and heal we can be cured but not healed healing is holistic healing is the whole and I often think that the heterosexual world has a lot to learn from the queer world. And people say, you know, oh, but my sexuality disappeared. It's like, well, then find a new version. Play <sighs> around. I don't mean become gay. I mean, what <laughs> else might feel good if what you were used to. So when you're a young and gay person, you are told that the only good sex is heterosex. You have to play around differently until you find out what works for you. The truth is, in our post-cancer, our post-menopausal bodies, we are different. We are changed. And that's why we have to grieve so that we can let that go and we can come into the new... It's still me. I didn't stop being me, but I am changed. I am different. I don't have a friend who became a mother who doesn't feel like she is changed and different from the from the from what my supervisor calls the crisis of motherhood. Yeah? Yes, it's great. Yes, you want it, but... Bloody hell, it's huge. <laughs> I don't have a friend who is infertile who didn't become changed by that experience. It is not the same as before we tried to have children when we lose our ability to have children. It is a different experience. We become changed and we are still this spark of self. How do I want yeah. that spark of myself to be? How do I want that spark of myself to be an embodied physical being for me? getting really into my yoga. And I say this as somebody who loves to do, loves to achieve. So yes, there were a lot of balances and inversion practices, but remembering that yin and restorative yoga hold such a lot of possibility. They don't have the sweat and they don't have the yay, I can handstand for an extra second, but they do have kindness. And kindness, generosity to ourselves. You know, just last night, I said to my therapist that I had, I'd had, I had another major health drama this summer that I'm beginning to talk about publicly, not quite there yet, but it was a, a non-cancer but massive version of my own mortality again. And I said to my therapist last night, I've just begun to realize, so four months later, that I had been expecting way too much of myself. 
I've been expecting, I mean, you know, I'm a yogi psychotherapist who does and who knows all these things. I've had cancer twice. Why am I not fine with this already? Why have I not integrated this other terrifying health experience already? Why am I not already finding the value in it? And my expectations are of myself around how I am meant to be with illness, with with gaining knowledge, with growing as a human being, are just too high. And when they are too high, what they do is they hurt me. I hurt me by demanding too much of myself. And when I realized that I was both expecting to uh, have found the value in it already and be being um, resolved and understand what I'd been through after just four months, it was a great revelation. I just was like, oh. And when I did that, I mean, look at me now. I'm sitting back in my chair as I tell you this. My lower belly has let go a bit. I'm breathing and talking a bit more slowly. We can choose to do those things physically. And if we do those things physically, sit back a bit, let the lower belly go, breathe, breathe a bit more slowly. It tells the system that we are feeling safer. We can do it that way, or we can do it the way where we understand this and then it happens. Two things work in synchronicity and we can make choices about what we need. And I wonder for everyone at home listening to you speak right now, what their own, for all of our listeners, what their own expectation was of how they thought they should manage their cancer diagnosis, whether they thought they should even know more about their menopause. No one really tells us menopause is becoming such a big thing. And then we're suddenly thinking we should know it all. We should know better. We should know how to manage our symptoms. We should know where to go for help and what the reality has been and whether we can also do what you're just doing at the moment and sit back take a big breath, relax our shoulders and think, actually, we're doing so much already. We're showing up every single day. We're trying really hard for every person, even listening to us now. They're here. They're listening to the Menopause and Cancer podcast because they're trying to find solutions. They're trying to do their absolute best. And I think maybe this is a good time to give yourself a big pat on your back <laughs> and tell yourself you are bloody amazing. Absolutely. You're and in a wonderful yeah the pat on the back that really works is the one where if you have two arms crossing your arms over and gently soothing yourself like this what that does is that awakens the parts of ourselves that know we need soothing and we get to breathe a bit i would also suggest and i'm going to keep doing this while i say it <laughs> that just because for the listeners in particular, they're the one who's had the experience. You don't have to be the go-to for every friend who next has the experience. You know, when you get your diagnosis and you go through it and a year or so later, you're like, oh God, I cannot think about cancer again. I can't. And then somebody says, well, you talk to my friend. They've just had the same diagnosis. And because there wasn't someone for you to talk to, you say yes. It's okay to take 30 seconds and ask yourself, do I want to say yes? You might want to help and it might be okay today. You might want to say to your mutual friend, you know what? I can't do it today. It feels a bit strong. I'll talk to your friend next week. And you might want to say no. And you are allowed to say no. We do not always have to be the stepping stones for other people's experience of our experience. Sometimes it's enough just to have the experience ourselves. Thank you, Stella. This has been not an easy conversation. And personally, I think, especially when I created the Menopause and Cancer podcast, I wanted to help and show people solutions. And often you go into this fixing mode. Fix it for yourself, fix it and help help fix it for everyone else and it's hard to talk about the loss and the grief so thank you for bringing all of that up today thank you danny thank you for this really vital work and also for reminding people and hopefully yourself that we need to look after ourselves in this vital work yeah thank you Ooh. 
I'm not sure about you, but some things really touched me uh, in speaking to Stella. If you're still here, if you've listened and watched the whole conversation with Stella, I'm not sure how you're feeling, but especially at the end when I was giving myself a big hug, I could just feel that I'm holding a lot of tension, anxiety, insecurity, um, the feeling that I'm still not fully trusting my body. How are you feeling <laughs> for yourself? I'm going to link to a couple of resources in the show notes because I know some of our conversations trigger uncomfortable feelings, difficult feelings, and it's so important we talk them through with someone. I found therapy really helpful at different parts of my journey over the last 10 years, and I hope you can reach out to someone too and that the conversation with Stella I know wasn't an easy one. And I hope you found value in Stella addressing the elephant in the room as such to talk about all of these difficult feelings she shared so beautifully. And yeah, I hope you found as much value as I did. Give yourself a big hug. I know I need a good cup of tea now. I'm going to make myself a hot water bottle and just take a moment out to digest. Find the gratitude in today. And also the self-compassion in giving myself and allowing myself a little bit of downtime after this conversation. I can't wait to see and speak to you on the podcast next week. And I'm giving myself a big hug today. But as always, I'm giving you a massive, massive hug as well. <laughs>